Good evening, and welcome to our presentation with Reverend Thomas Curran of the Society of Jesus, coordinator for the Jesuit Prison Education Network, known as JPEN, sponsored by Alpha Sigma Nu, the Jesuit Honor Society. Thank you to everyone here for braving the winter weather and making it to the presentation. And I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to those who made it via Zoom, where we had just over 100 res re registrants. My name is Megan Olinger, and I am a senior studying finance and accounting at Georgetown. I serve as this year's chapter president of Alpha Sigma Nu on our campus, and I have the distinct honor of introducing Father Curran. One of the tenets of Alpha Sigma Nu is service. As a student at our Jesuit university, I have come to understand that service is a commitment to others, both near and on the margins. Tonight, we have the opportunity to renew our commitment to serve by hearing from Father Curran, who recently wrote, as companions in a mission of reconciliation and justice, we are invited to be co-laborers in mercy. We are called to be in a right relationship with the divine, our neighbors, and our created world. Prison education is a means for pursuing this relationship. Father Curran's passion for this work began at Rockhurst University, the Jesuit University of Kansas City, where he served as president from 2006 to 2022. At Rockhurst, Father Curran led a strengthened focus on mission and values, establishing a number of social justice initiatives, including the Chillicothe Companions Program, which offers Rockhurst University courses to incarcerated women and staff at the Chillicothe Correctional Center. In addition, he oversaw numerous major capital improvements that enhanced the campus, including construction of Arupe Hall and the Magis Activity Center, and the renovation of Rockhurst's most historic building, Sedgwick Hall, the home of St. Luke's College of Nursing and Health Sciences, which Rockhurst acquired in 2020 under Father Curran's leadership and vision. Father Curran's wide variety of interests is apparent in his educational background. He holds a BA in politics from DeSales University, an MA in theology from DeSales School of Theology, an MA in liberal studies, public policy, and government from Georgetown University, a JD from the Catholic University of America, and an MBA from St. Joseph's University. In November 2021, the Jewish Community Relations Bureau honored Father Curran with its Henry W. Block Humans Relations Award for his work to pursue equity on campus and throughout the Kansas City community. Father Curran has served on a number of boards, including the Midwest Research Institute in Kansas City, Missouri, St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, KC Common Good in Kansas City, Missouri, and Loyola University in New Orleans. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Father Curran. Thank you, Megan. Good to be with you, as they say, right? After you hear the obituary, it's good to see the body. It's a great pleasure to be with you tonight to speak about something which uh, I'm passionate about, and I believe that all of you are passionate about. Uh, while we have several that are participating by way of uh, Zoom, virtual, we also have a nice room of, of folks who are trying to keep warm here on the campus of Georgetown University. We are uh, digging out from a little little snowstorm. Uh, I call it snow, little snow, because I'm coming from Denver, uh, Colorado. And so what do we get? Four or five inches here in Denver. We call this a dusting. <laughs> So Jesuit Prison Education, or J-PEN, J-P-E-N. I'd like to start out with, and I hope that's on your screen, both virtually as well as us here, uh, that in our way of proceeding, uh, in any Jesuit venture, any Jesuit apostolate, any Jesuit work, uh, we speak about a way of proceeding. And we do that with looking at what are the signs of the times, reading the signs of the times, meeting people where they are and acting accordingly. So when you hear this in this Jesuit, like, what's our way of proceeding? What's It's reading the signs of the times, meeting people where they are and then acting accordingly. So what are some of the signs of the times? Yeah. So in a world where we have what's more than 7 billion people, the United States constitutes just about 5% of that population maybe about 335 million, give or take, right? So that's about 5% of the world's population. However, the United States has 25% of those who are incarcerated in the world. So the 8 million people that are incarcerated, one out of every four would be in a U.S. prison. It's pretty staggering. It's one of the signs of times. 
There's also the issue of, of mental health, right? Uh, increased concern about being healthy and being integrated. Well, the three largest mental health institutions in the United States are jails. One is in New York, Rikers Island. One is in the LA County, and the other is in Cook County, Illinois. When someone is sent to prison um, in our penal system, uh, we consider it a success is if someone is incarcerated and they're released and they don't commit a crime for another three years, we consider that a statistical success. Why do I share that? It's just more the signs of the time. It's a pretty low threshold, right? In the 1980s, so what, some 40 years ago, for every dollar we spent on our prisons, we spent $3 for the indigent, for the aids to family with dependent children, food stamps, all of those social programs. Fast forward to today, our prison expenditures are 200% greater than those for the indigent. We have made this a multi-billion dollar industry. How much does it cost to incarcerate someone? On average, about forty, forty-five thousand dollars a year in some facility. That's on average. But there are some outliers. For example, in 2021, these the statistics for from the controller's office of the city of New York, they spent five hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars per person to incarcerate one person in a year in Rikers Island. Staggering, over a half a million dollars just for one person. And, and I can assure you, having been there and been part of the classes uh, through the Manhattan College, that it's not Club Med. It's, those dollars are not being spent to, to make this facility an attractive place. It is less than attractive. In some cases, it's just downright inhuman. About 700,000 people are, are released each year. Uh, and so most who are in prison, most will be released. But of the 700,000 that are released from prison each year, one year later, 75% are still unemployed. And we talk about the uh, need for workforce and, and how we can get in, in, in good employees. Well, we are releasing uh, folks every year and prisons are doing, some are doing better jobs than other in terms of, of workforce development. But even those that are equipped with credentials and in our cases with, with sometimes with degrees, uh, what, what are we doing in terms of engaging those folks? And there's more and more uh, effort throughout the country to ban the box, which is that, that notion of an employer where you have to mark off, have you ever been incarcerated? Because when employers see that, they are reluctant uh, and oftentimes don't want anything to do, despite the fact that that person may be quite equipped and quite ready and quite desirous of that job. It's college education, some just some college education, just perhaps a, a couple of courses is which constitute some college education, that can reduce recidivism up to 43%. So just a little bit of investment can literally re reduce and, and, and be an, an antidote to this. We're spending billions of dollars. So we have about what, about 3000 colleges and universities in the US. How many prisons do we have? Anyone here want to take a guess at how many prisons, carceral facilities we have in the US? And granted, there's state institutions, there's federal, there's juvenile, there's there's those for, for uh, Native Americans. There's a variety of, of, of those. But, and, and of course, then there's the little jails, the county jails. So here are the statistics. Over 6,000 in our country. Over 1,500 state institutions, close to 100 federal institutions, 3,000 juvenile institutions, right? So it just, it's just absolutely staggering. And because we have moved more and more people, especially since the 1980s, when we did this, you know, say no to drugs and three strikes, you're out. We went, um, we, we, we literally went from some couple hundred thousand people in, in prison to over 2 million people. So we just started to warehouse people. And because we could not uh, accommodate all of those, 
we outsource the care of those prisons. So now we have uh, what there's known as the private prisons. So the state pays facilities to take care of them. All of this is so that we are warehousing people. And I say warehousing because it's, it's, it's a real question about are we rehabilitating? It's, I think we have to admit that the, the, day, the data, the statistics, the reality, what are the signs of the times? We have built a multitude of prisons out of sight. The fact that you kind of, and the audience here is kind of astounded when I said 6,000 facilities here, but yet there, there are places we don't see them, there are lots of them. And they're in communities where oftentimes that's the biggest employer in that community. Those are just some of the things that, that we're, we're facing. So, so what about that? And how does that relate to back to this, this notion of this Jesuit way of proceeding, which is reading the signs of the times? So if they're the signs of the times, and then we're to meet people where they are, how are we acting accordingly? Well, if there's 3,000 colleges and universities, and 27 of them in the U.S. are, are Jesuit, right? But we have 6,000 carcel facilities. And why shouldn't and why can't Jesuit education be in the prisons? And here are the reasons why prison education is for Jesuits at this time. Is this something new? Is this an idea I woke up with and say, let's get into prison education? Actually, this goes back to the very, very early founding of the Society of Jesus. So when Ignatius Loyola and his founders came together and forming this own Compania de Jesus, right, this company of Jesus, more commonly referred to as the Jesuits, and one of those initial companions, Jerome Nadal, said that we accept from God the care of those whom nobody is caring for, even if there is someone who ought to be caring for them. That we accept from God the care of those whom nobody is caring for, even if there is someone who ought to be caring for them. So that was the, the thinking of that. But there was also the experience of that, because Ignatius Loyola, yes, we know he experience the cannonball, right? And so he goes from being soldier to being infirmed, to being a, a seeker, right? To be ultimately to being a pilgrim. And then in, in part of that experience, right? He has that cannonball moment. He convalesces. He goes to uh, Montserrat, lays down his sword, and then walks across uh, the little bridge there uh, over the Cardinaire River into this little town of Manresa and spends the next 10 plus months uh, reflecting on his life and writes this thing called the spiritual exercises. It is in the spiritual exercises that all works of the Society of Jesus are based. So here at Georgetown, at Rockhurst, St. Louis University, Regis University, Marquette, any of these schools, uh, Creighton, all of them are rooted in the spiritual exercises. And in the spiritual exercises, especially in in the, in the third week, where we are invited to consider the hidden humanity of Christ. The hidden humanity of Christ. I'll come back to that. When Ignatius Loyola, after he had become filled with zeal and ardor for God, and he decided he wanted to go to the Holy Land, went to the Holy Land and thought he would be a preacher there, but he was kicked out, was told it was too dangerous. And so he came back uh, to his to his native Spain, this Basque Spaniard, then wants to fill folks with what he has learned, his zeal for for this this for his, his love for God. However, at that time, um, you just couldn't go into the streets and start preaching as he did. But nonetheless, he did that. And because they were concerned about him preaching heresy, he was imprisoned. Not once, but twice in prison. It was in prison that he came to this realization that I'm going to keep getting imprisoned if I don't get an education. So he had this moment of clarity in prison. So back to why should the Jesuits be in prison? Well, their founder was in prison. Their founder was in prison because he was trying to preach the word of God, but didn't have the credentials. I need to go back to school. And of course, we know we can say the rest is history. And now we have, what, over 180 institutions worldwide of higher learning. And 
hundreds more of, of secondary schools and primary schools and retreat houses. But cannonball moment, which literally knocked him off of his feet, and lays him flat for close to a year. Then spending this time on the Cardinair River, over, overlooking the Cardinair River, and having this moment of clarity about what I'm to be about. But then he has another moment of clarity. And I believe that moment of clarity that we don't speak about is his moment of clar moments of clarity in the prisons. I need an education. So he and his companions, of course, go back and were known, Jesuits say, oh, you're known for, for education. But I, I um, contend that that prison helped get him there uh, because of the fact he was there. So all of that to build this case that from the very beginning, with Nadal's statements and Ignatius's experiences, we've been in the prisons. And there have been literally hundreds of cases where, where Jesuits and companions have worked in the prisons, have been imprisoned, uh, in, including Pedro Rupe, for whom this building is named. So there's no, there's no lack of familiarity, right? Uh, and many of those have been with, with what we would call prison ministry. Uh, but I, I'm involved, and in, in Trey, Orlando Jones, whom you'll meet, are involved with prison education. There's a little bit of a difference. So prison ministry is, is good, uh, yeah, but, but we are not in the prisons um, offering, directing, a, if you will, starting with, with spiritual things. We're about education. And why is that? Well, all of us, or I would contend that just about all of us know that, that uh, education, and especially Jesuit education, we say it's transformative, the transformative experiences that we've had. So the conversion, if you will, comes about through this educational experience. So we're not in proselytizing. We're not in there trying to raise market share and get more converts. We're in the prisons to educate, and it is through that education that these transformational moments, these moments of clarity uh, are taking place. And I'll share several stories of, of how that is the case. At this time, it also aligns with something that we have been referring to and continue to refer to is these UAPs, the Universal Apostolic Preferences. And so the Society of Jesus, uh, I, under Father uh, Arturo Sosa, uh, established that there would have four thrust for us over the next 10 years. So from 2019 to 2029, and if we can, can this be scrolled up a bit. So the universal apostolic preferences, the they four 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 action verbs here. Um, uh, stand by for technical assistance. You want me to hold on? I just want to scroll that up. So mm -hmm. Perfect. Right. Okay. That's great. So you just have to Excellent. Click, you have to click here and then. Perfect. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. So why do I mention the universal apostolic preferences? Remember when we were in grade school, we learned action verbs? <laughs> well, I think the easiest way to remember the four apostolic preferences, the act, act, action verbs, right? Show, walk, accompany, and collaborate. But what are we showing? We're showing the way to God through the spiritual exercises. Remember what I said, all of our works are rooted in the spiritual exercises. So the first thing is, to show the way to God through the spiritual exercises. The second is to walk with the marginalized, the poor. I'm sharing these in order to see how these align, what we're doing here, prison education, does it align with this? Well, rooted in the spiritual exercises, look for the hidden humanity of God. Secondly, that we would walk with the marginalized. Thirdly, accompany the youth in a hope-filled future. Well, this is to say we have a significant number of our young who are incarcerated. And we can accompany in lots of ways. And that's one of the places where we can truly accompany. And collaborate in the care for our common home, right? That notion of justice, which is a three-pronged piece, a right relationship with, with, with God, a right relationship with my neighbor, and a right relationship with the created world. I said that education is about transformation. And in my estimation, prison education is about our call to a shared humanity, shared humanity. 
in the spiritual exercise in the third week, we're invited to see the hidden humanity of Christ and to see the hidden humanity of Christ of those who are incarcerated. Again, the third week of the spiritual exercises. It is an expression of justice, as I said, this right relationship and uh, with God neighboring the creator world. And reconciliation is about ending the estrangement with my sister and my brother. This summer, the AJCU uh, gathering, so that, uh, the AJCU is the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities, and we have two of the leaders from the AJCU here tonight, uh, and, and uh, they are very much involved with, with the, the uh, concerted work of the, of the Society of Jesus and, and our colleges. So Deanna and, and Jenny, thank you for being here. Uh, and they are, are are very much working on preparing this summer's gathering where we're going to have uh, folks from faculty, staff from all of the schools come together at Loyola of Chicago for three days. And the focus will be on faith, justice, and reconciliation. What is faith? What is justice? What is reconciliation? So reconciliation is the end of the estrangement with my sister and brother. Justice is this right relationship. And I was asked... Uh, to be one of the co-chairs for one of the tracks on prison education. And, and we will spend time with faculty, staff, a variety of schools. What does that look like? How are we setting up such a program? How did this come about? How did the Jesuit schools get involved with this? To my knowledge, the first Jesuit school that was involved with this was Regis University in the early 90s. I started getting involved and at that time there was Pell money and then the Pell money went away and then the program was suspended. Then uh, in the early 2000s, uh, well actually 2000, the Bard College in New York started the Bard Prison Initiative. And they were featured uh, one night on 60 Minutes. And a gentleman by the name of Daniel Karpowitz was featured. Uh, and there are a couple of folks from St. Louis University who were just inspired by this story. And so in 2008, St. Louis University, a Jesuit school, started offering some theology classes uh, to a men's facility in Bon Terre, Missouri. And then a couple of years later, that grew into uh, some general ed courses. And then by 2013, 2014, they were actually offering an associate's degree. And now today, go forward, they've had several graduations and, and uh, off and running. 2014, 2015, uh, St. Louis University reached out to me. I was on staff at Rockhurst at that time in Kansas City. There's 21 correctional facilities in the state of Missouri. 19 of them are men's facilities and two are women's facility. The closest women's facility is in Chillicothe, Missouri. Uh, Chillicothe, Missouri, about two hours from Kansas City. Do you ever hear the expression, best thing since sliced bread? It comes from Chillicothe, Missouri. <laughs> I kid you not. How is that so? So in the early, well, in the 1920s, um, this gentleman uh, from Iowa uh, came down uh, to Missouri with this uh, mechanism that would slice bread. And they were like, no, no one likes sliced bread. You buy a whole loaf. And he couldn't live it away. But this little place in, in, in Chillicothe, Missouri accepted it. And in 1928, 1929, they introduced bread slicing machines. Hence, the town is the best thing since sliced bread. And they literally have T-shirts in it. Anyway, so they, 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 uh, they have that claim to fame. Plus, they have a women's correctional facility of about 1,400 women. It's a maximum security facility. And is one of the two women's facilities. And so we were contacted about starting a program there. And it took a couple of years there. Uh, and then rolled out the first course there. And we have a, a cohort of, of women and a cohort of correctional officers who are doing college classes one course at a time. Happy to say that that first cohort of women will receive their Associate of Arts degree from Rockhurst University next December. Yeah, incredible. One course at a time. And there's also a, a cohort, like a set of correctional officers. And we do that intentionally because we it's sometimes when you do things in the prisons uh, you, you really well not sometimes you really need to the assistance and the companionship of the prison personnel and so when we offer these courses to the 
to the guards, to the staff, not at the same time, but the same course, it really helps to grease the skids. And dare I say, it helps them to focus on their homework assignments together. I uh, kid you not, in some cases in Missouri there, I had prison staff saying that I had challenges with this person or that person, and now I needed to work with them because we had the same homework assignment. <laughs> and we know when we have assignments that sometimes makes friends out of former enemies, right? So what a great way, just these little things that happen, these things that happen over and over again. So St. Louis launches its program in, in 2008. Then by 2015, we launched the program in Rockhurst. And when I started and I spoke to the, to the warden, uh, and the warden kept saying, well, the inmates, the inmates, the incarcerated, and they use these terms. And so uh, we changed the terms over time. Sometimes they say prisoners, then they say inmates. Now they say offenders. And I said, can we say students? And they said, well, the offenders. And I said, can we say students? And the warden said, well, whatever. So no, it's, it's important because they're Rockhurst, they're St. Louis, they're Marquette students, right? And to that end, I, I asked, could we have permission for them to wear their T-shirt of the university? And we gave them Rockhurst University T-shirts. And they were allowed to wear those T-shirts to class. I can tell you, those T-shirts, I thought it was important because it's a gesture of one's humanity, one's dignity. It's more than that. Well, it's, it's that, but, but that, that reflects something very, very significant. In most um, prisons, everything you have in that prison is accounted for, down to every sock, every piece of underwear, every book. And so if you give something as a T-shirt, something else has to go out. So getting permission for that shirt to be given and to be worn is a big deal. I've had students tell me that, uh, well, a couple of things. One student said, I never put this in the dryer because this is one of my prized possessions. And, and holds it and said, I, we gave a second t-shirt and held it up to her face and said, this is almost like gold to me. We were allowed to wear those t-shirts and just like we put on a nice sweatshirt of our, our, and it says we're part of that community. It's a big gesture. And then going back into the rest of the community there, and they're speaking to their other companions. What did you learn in this class? What's going on in this? It's very, very significant, right? So it's more than just a t-shirt. It's part of our identity and humanity. So that's a, just a gesture that I have about giving these these t-shirts and helping with that. I said that it's evangelizing versus proselytizing. What's the difference? So proselytizing is, you know, we're doing, and, and you know, proselytizing can be good, you know, again, doing, doing you know, the work of, you know, on fire with Jesus. And that's good to be on fire with Jesus. But we are evangelizing, not proselytizing. This past semester, I'm currently living in Denver, Colorado at Regis University. And Regis's prison program is in its second year. So I got to teach, had the privilege of teaching in three of the correctional facilities in Colorado this past spring. And in, in one of those facilities, each of them is about two hours away, in one of the facilities, uh, one of the students said um, several things, but it told me how he's been very turned on to Jesuit education and the Pope and all of this. I'm like, well, how'd that happen? And he shared the following. He said, so when you came and I saw that you were teaching this class and you're a priest, I'm like, well, and then, you know, I'm a Baptist. And that way we don't connect too much with Catholics. And I don't, you know, we didn't have a whole lot to say about your Pope, but here I take this course and I get really turned on about this. He, so much so that he wanted to learn everything he can about Jesuits. When we gave them their certificate, I gave him a copy of the Jesuit case for everything, for the Jesuit understanding of everything. Part of the course that I had was this leading lives that matter. And one of the sections was on uh, issues of the environment. And so they read articles by Rachel Carson, who started Earth Day. And they also read uh, sections of Laudato Si. Well, he wanted to read the entire encyclical. And he read it several times um, and said, I really like your, what your Pope has to say. And here I am as a Baptist saying that this, this education is transformative. 
And that's my point about education being transformative. He also said to me, you know, I'm now interested in those other matters, those religious matters, but if you had just come in here initially to have a service or celebrate mass, I would have walked right by. But the fact that you were offering education, I was interested. So my point here is, is that what a great starting point, right? Education is transformative. Education brings forth a conversion in all of us about understanding how we all share that, that humanity. And so they're the things that I, I see on a regular basis. And in the, every, every place I go to, and we are now in nine Jesuit universities, so St. Louis University, Rockhurst University, Regis University, Loyola, New Orleans, Marquette University, John Carroll in Cleveland, Ohio, Scranton and Georgetown University, and St. John's College in Belize. In 2002, I was asked to go to Regis to become the coordinator of JPEN. And let's not have these island operations, but let's start bringing the schools together so that we have best practices, and that's my work. So my work is, is about helping the schools to create a prison education program. Why? Because it is a call to our shared humanity. Why do I share shared humanity? It's back to rooted in the spiritual exercises and because of this. In every one of the facilities I've been in, repeatedly, over and over and over, the same refrain that I hear from the students is, I feel human again. I feel human again. Which is why I say that this whole effort is about Shared humanity. 3,000 colleges, but 6,000 correctional facilities. Billions of dollars. Recidivism. We're saying what's successful if after three years you don't commit. It's a pretty low threshold. It's not working. But we all know because we share this, this patrimony, this heritage in Jesuit education, and we know how transformative it has been in our lives. And now we are in the process of reading the signs of the times, meeting people where they are, and acting accordingly. And I believe that this is going to move from a program to a movement. And this is something that whether you're progressive or conservative, I think we'd all agree that the current efforts are not working. And I am not in any way diminishing the crimes. And in some cases, uh, we, yeah, in, in just about every one of our facilities, uh, we are teaching uh, folks who will never be released, never, uh, because they have been convicted of, of, of murder, in some cases, heinous crimes. One particular case where we had someone who she and her lover decided to rub out her husband and take the insurance money, and gruesome, made national news. Um, and incarcerated now close to 30 years, um, and for the longest period uh, was estranged from her father, who was a judge. Two of her uncles were attorneys. Thought, like, how could that possibly happen? But it did, and they had not spoken. So when she started the courses and wrote to her dad and said, I'm, back, I'm in college, that she'd always hoped for, they reconciled, and the father died six months later. They're the kind of things that happen over and over and over again. There's classroom experiences which you and I have had, and that's the way it is in the prisons. These are not watered down classes. The assignments are due, and it's a challenge, no technology. So, you know, it's pencil, paper. Um, in some cases, we have what they call what, an LMS, a learning management system. And it's very, very rudimentary. There's no there's no access to computers because of security. Persons are in the business of security. We're in the business of education. But we can work together. And I'm hearing over and over from, from the wardens, from, from folks, that this has the opportunity to change a culture. It changes relationships between the incarcerated and, and those staff. And, and giving folks opportunity. Education is the transformative experience. When I asked faculty at um, Rockhurst and other schools, tell me about that experience. 
Um, the first person he asked was an English professor, um, extraordinary professor, taught 25 plus years. And so how's it going? He said to me, this is one of the most transformational experiences I've had in the classroom. And then he's changed. He said, no, this is one of the most transformational experiences of my life. And I hear that over and over and over again. What about safety? He was recently with a professor and said, do you feel unsafe? Never, never feel unsafe. You know, and, and it, is, it, is, um, it is an experience for when you come into a correctional facility and you the, the big metal door slides, you're let in, it slides behind you and you're locked in, get security and then they open the next one and it is, it's, the, it's a disturbing experience. But after you go through that process, and you do have to be trained and the whole piece of that in ongoing uh, education, once you get into the classroom, it's your classroom. And to have a professor say, do you know what it's like to teach a class where when I give an assignment, everybody reads it, and then I get questions like, can you explain footnote number four? <laughs> can you imagine classes like that? That's just a teacher's dream. To have that kind of class. So when you ask a professor to be a part of this, and they do, and they say, I just love this, because they love being with students. So that's a universal phenomenon, if you will. So at this point, I'm going to bring forth a, a, a companion, a colleague from my met now through this, who is part of the uh, Georgetown Prison and Justice in it. Institute and uh, Orlando, Trey, James, would you come up, share your story, and talk a little bit? And I think then we can take some questions. More than any y'all can imagine, I appreciate being here. I came all the way from Baltimore to be here tonight because I couldn't imagine being anywhere else because that's how grateful I am for this Jesuit education that I have. And this is the first time that I get to stand before any audience and boast a Jesuit education. Because I equate my Jesuit education to like um, a baby without a vocabulary and unable to tell a story. And you know how a baby without a vocabulary cry all the time. And loving parents are attentive enough to know what the what the baby need? The baby don't have a vocabulary. And that was me prior to a Jesuit education. I had no words to define my life. I'm consigned to a life of poverty, low expectation. On this very day today, January the 16th, my father was shot 16 times by the police. No investigation. 1970 we're talking about. Mother was 14 years old. By the time I'm 16 years old, I'm sent to the Maryland Penitentiary for the rest of my life for a crime that I didn't commit, but couldn't boost being innocent of because with no vocabulary, being consigned to a life, I had to accept it. I'm ignorant. And in that ignorance, there's a certain blissfulness. So I accept it. So I go off to the penitentiary for a crime that I couldn't that I didn't do, no way of defending myself because I had no education. In fact, I was so dumb, it took me an hour and a half to watch 60 Minutes. Honestly, my reading was uh, third grade and my math was worse than that. <clears throat> and there's no loving parents to listen to what my every urge and what my every demand is, what I need. So I'm just an annoying, you know, when you a baby and you got these cries, loving parents and they're attentive, they try to figure out what you want. But as you get older and you have no words, you can't define it. You're just a nuisance and a bother. So here come 93. And I know most people here too young to appreciate the Zagais at that time, but you got the nation of Islam here. And then the penitentiary, you know, this dichotomy there that limit you more. Demagoguery is there. White people, evil, Catholic, Catholicism, stay away from it, right? So here go Father Tim Brown. He's about like five, 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 six, with his collar teaching, you know, constitutional law. Jailhouse lawyers don't get that. 
that kind of education. You get case law and become so annoying to real lawyers, no one want to deal with you. And then he comes in with his buddy, a Jew, from Loyola. Nobody wants this. Three years later, I was able to boast. I'm acquainted with the accumulated wisdom of the ages. That was how, that what made me attractive. So when, so when Father Tom came and talk about there was no proselytizing, I get it. But the education is infused with a spirit that demands that you become better than who you are. Because I realized in my quest to not be impoverished, not to be everything that being black and born into a ghetto with uneducated parents deem you to be, to avoid that, I'm just servicing myself. And it wasn't until years later with a Jesuit education that I come to realize that everything that I did for myself dies when I die. But now I get to be better to everyone I come in contact with. That's what I exist to do now, to be a better friend to you than you can be to me. That's what got me through the hopelessness of the penitentiary. I'm 16 years old and I'm standing before a judge being told after being convicted of first degree murder, that you will die in the Maryland Penitentiary, a place that was built when Thomas Jefferson was the president of the United States. And I stayed there for 37 years, two months in a day. And when you look at me, I don't look like nearly of the things that I went through. And you can't tell how dumb I was. I mean, the thing about a Jesuit education, you get to question everything. And even the one thing that really blew my mind is Ignatius probably would have been offended by being called a Jesuit. It was offered in a pejorative sense. But the work is being better to the world than the world is to you. I committed myself to me, me, me. Well, and even when I studied, and, and, and this was one of the biggest issues when we was dealing with the constitutional law of Father Tim Brown. You know, hadn't accept that, okay, I understand the 13th Amendment, that the criminal justice system that we endure today is directly recipient of slavery. Slavery, convict leasing, now what we have today, mass incarceration. Because slavery was so valuable to this nation's economy that it couldn't just be abolished, so it had to be codified. So we got the 13th Amendment. Slavery is abolished, except. So what that exception do? It brought in what was known as convict leasing. Through Jesuit education, they brought the books, Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow. And while mass incarceration isn't as necessary to our nation's economy as slavery, and convict lease, and we're still talking about a trillion dollar industry that rely on people being ignorant, not educated. And when I talk about education, I'm talking about more than ABC one, two, three. I got that through the HBC. You know, I got my, my undergraduate from COP, very proud of it, but I wasn't able to define my world and, and, and reduce it and make it smaller than me. And I don't mean this in an arrogant way, but in a necessary way, because um, at 16, I'm told I'm going to die in prison. And so I'm the roof of hope. And, and any human being, any man, any woman, without hope is no different than any other animal God created. That's the thing that separates us from other creatures God created. So. Now, with this hope in me, not that I'm going to overturn my, my, my life sentences, because that didn't happen until like 18 months ago, but I was bold enough to try new things. I worked in hospice care because we learned eschatology, death, how frightening that was. And I went into a hospice care, dealing with people, and I learned from dealing with a, a dude that was at Earned brotherhood that hated everything that I was. He taught me to love and to be compassionate. And I talk about in the old, too fast, small, too. Dude, Mr. Harden, he died from cancer. 
He got the swath stickers all over him, everything. He gets stuck between the bed. And in an instant, I mean, I'm picking him up. Nobody else would touch him. But I had to because how can I claim to be educated and not willing to give more than what I got? Because as long as you're the focal point of your life, it's the most ignorant thing that you can do. I mean, a Jesuit education inspires you to question everything. I'm talking about stuff as silly as when you read the Corinthians, wonder, did they ever write Paul back? You know what I mean? And you find the humor in it. Because a Jesuit education, as you acquaint yourself with the world's accumulated wisdom, you can find humor in things where other folks ain't. Because in order to live this life, you have to learn, or to master this life, I suspect, you have to learn to laugh at the things that would ordinarily make you cry. Like this morning when I woke up, January 16th, 52 years ago today, my father was murdered by the police. This was before you get investigations and all that. I'm looking so forward to this event that Father Tom invited me to months ago, and I look out, and the snow on the car. Look much more sinister than what it was. I didn't think it was going to be that light. And Joy telling me, she got, I haven't shovel snow since I was 16, 15. You don't shovel snow in prison. You just, unless you have that job assignment, they the two dollar day jobs. I never had a job that good. And I gotta go out in the morning, 5.30, seven o'clock, it's still dark in Dundalk. And I did it and it was light. And my neighbors are elderly. And before I realized it, I'm, their walkway and stuff is done too. And I feel good. One of the things that get me through this life, and I've only been home 17 months. I was released on July 29th, 2022. After 37 years, two months in a day, or 13,577 days, right? So I'm very new into this experiment. But I know that when I go into my community and I'm looking at like little black boys, little black girls that don't have the benefit of a Jesuit education, with very limited vocabularies so they can't define their world. I make it a point to use language that's dignified. When they see me walk, you know, it's with a dignity. And when they see me relating to people, I got one girlfriend, as good looking as I am. Because people are looking at me to see how you supposed to love. I was sent to prison for a murder that I didn't commit. Wrongfully convicted, but I was never innocent a day in my life. And through this education, I've learned to stop asking God for justice. When I pray to God, in Jesus' name, give me mercy. And lo and behold, that's what I've been receiving. And I believe that as long as I devote myself to using my education to give more than what I get, I'll be okay. And that's in line with Christ. That's in line with Lord Ignatius, to be gallant, to be bold. Because there was one time when being educated, speaking with proper diction. Now, my diction still needs a lot to be desired because um, the vast majority of my education is the erudition. And, you know, the words that I have and my vocabulary now, I mean, I'm an accomplished sesquipedalian. But I haven't heard many of the words pronounced. So when I shoot for those multi syllable words, right? I haven't heard them before. So I have friends like Mark around me who speak different languages that may help me out. But I know I've been going on and on and on. I'm gonna ask you to speak about your work with JPI. Oh, see? Now, my work with Je um, Georgetown Prison and Justice Initiative, everybody who have been, or anyone who have been negatively impacted by the criminal justice system, we develop them, build them through education to prepare them for a professional world. And we got like many tenants, like we got the pivot program and the Pearl Legal Program, where our professors from Georgetown prepare those impacted to be business entrepreneur, Pearl Legal prepare for the legal thing. And then in prison, at Protection, we have a bachelor's program where, you know, 
Coherts can get a Georgetown degree after like five years, but you have to get transferred to production and all that. And then at the DC jail, we have a scholars program, right? Now, um, Evelyn Rupert is much better equipped to speak to that. My passion is mainly with making an exoneree where um, Georgetown students, undergraduates, take cases, five at this point, where the person is likely innocent, wrongfully convicted, examine the case, study the case, do a documentary, make the person a human again. Because the one thing that affects most people in prison, more so than being broke, more so than being a minority, is being obscure, being nobody. And that's what an education does. It gives a person a voice and a chance to create a narrative of their own life as opposed to being the subject of other folks. And so at, you know, Georgetown Prison and Justice Initiative, the marginalized, the those who have been rendered as I was superfluous, that's who we come to see. And it's with the spirit of this Georgetown education. Okay, we're gonna ask, uh, we're gonna open this up for Q and A because there's some questions that folks wanna ask. Okay. Uh, is there is there gearing up for questions? Uh, just wanted to share. This is our logo now, Jesuit Prison Education Network. And then on the back of our t-shirts are all the Jesuit schools where we have our, our, our education program. So there they are, St. John's College, Belize, Regis, Colorado, Georgetown and DC, Loyola University, New Orleans, St. Louis University, Missouri, Rockhurst University, Missouri, John Carroll in Ohio, University of Scranton, Pennsylvania, and Marquette University in Wisconsin. So it is... Uh, so we're here to, do they have some questions that came in from the, okay, Sh sure, please. Yeah, so we're, I think they're gonna have us use the mic so that folks can hear that, right? Um, have you all started to explore any partnerships with Homeboy Industries or is it a little bit too early to do that? Well, a little bit. So they made these t-shirts. Oh, <laughs> uh, we've had conversations with them, but yes. Yeah, so, I mean, where, where are opportunities there? But yeah, that was the first thing. Have any of our, oh, hi, this is Jenny. Um, have any of our programs started to use the Pell Grant now that the Pell Grant is available again? I know it's cumbersome and complicated, but yeah, um, any programs using the Pell there Grant? There are a couple of schools that are now have been declared eligible and they are in the process of, of doing that. And there's others that are pursuing that. So we're hoping that that may assist as well. So Jenny Smolson here, VP for Government Relations at AJCU has very much been helping us uh, with that. But we have a few that are eligible, a few that are looking at that. And we can talk a little bit about, I know one that needs your assistance. So thank you guys. Both the uh, speeches were uh, awesome. I had no idea that there was privatized prisons. I'd always assume that that's inherently government function. So I was wondering, do you have, because you get worried about, you know, an industrial complex of money right. making, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any differences of going into a private prison versus a public prison or not? Really? We have not been invited into a private yet. We're still in, in state facilities and we're not in any federal ones, but, but that doesn't mean we, we, we can't. And, and it doesn't mean that we're the only ones that are doing this. Villanova University is doing this. Uh, University Notre Dame University is, has a center for social concerns and they actually just reached out to us last week. They want to partner with us. So there's more than enough work out there <laughs> so uh stay tuned but i i can see that happening right in starting these programs it really requires a relationship with with the schools and and with the correctional facility the department of corrections and, and you have to keep in mind that they're in the business of security we're in the business of education and these take quite a while to kind of roll out right and we're on their turf but great question I have a personal question. Uh, could you um, talk about the time that you knew that guy was going to pull you through and that you were going to be okay? Sure. Mm. Well, there were times where I didn't really believe it. And if a person tell me they haven't wrestled with God and didn't believe in him, mm. and prior to... Me coming home when the pandemic hit, 
Man, I was so angry with God. Every blasphemous thing you can say to him, I said it. If you real, you kill me right now. I couldn't breathe. I had to go over through the toilet, all that kind of stuff, right? And you know how God look out for babies and fools, and I've been had my wisdom teeth. Laws change. I get the lawyers stuck because, you know, Georgetown students start representing me. Then the uh, vaccine came out and being hard-headed. You know how they tell you, take the shot, wait 15 minutes. I didn't. I go back to the cell and uh, like this was void of all energy. As soon as I got my shot, I'm represented. The hope is coming back in my life, right? And I felt like I just couldn't stand up to what I'm going out. And I just dropped to my knees and said, Lord, remember that stuff I said to you last summer? If you could just like forgive me and just let's 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 go on again. And I've had them conversations with God several times in my incarceration. But you know, the one thing that grandma gave me was my faith. And and the faith that I hold on to is what have always sustained me. I can't answer at what points. Because even now, sometimes, but the one thing that sustained me is I know God is real. And when I pursue my belief in him through Jesus, I've been making out. Other questions? We have some questions from some questions on Zoom. As we're waiting for the questions on Zoom, I uh, have some other things here talking about. So one of the uh, students uh, in the Regis program uh, spoke. Uh, I, uh, there were other programs that were available, and he chose the Regis program, which is a Jesuit school. And I asked him a story about that, and he said, well, I was in the license plate department. So we still have, what, about 15 or so states that still use prisons to make license plates. And he was making the license plate, and, and this license plate for Regis University, and the tagline on in there is men and women for and with others. And he's like, what's that all about? And he asked about that and found out it's a Jesuit university. What's a Jesuit university? That prompted him to explore that. And now he's getting his degree from, from Regis uh, and said that I wouldn't want any other education but a Jesuit education. So through a license plate, right? And another student, uh, ready for first question? I think we have four questions. Please. Uh, the first one is, any outreach to young people in troubled neighborhoods to avoid crime and incarceration? So at this point, we have an, it's a great question. It calls for a real comprehensive approach, right? Which is the environment there. Uh, we, we have not done that yet. We're really just kind of, um, my mantra for this has been, what can we do that's modest, achievable, and sustainable? Modest, achievable, and sustainable. So just little classroom sessions kind of growing, but certainly uh, a com more comprehensive approach kind of uh, deterring the, that pursuit of crime, uh, education, and then re-entry as well. You know, so there's a whole continuum. Again, lots of things for us to, to do here, but at this point, we're just doing prison education. Okay, question number two. Are there ways that those of us who are not faculty but are associated with one of the participating Jesuit universities can help with this program? Absolutely. Uh, Contact your advancement office for that university and say that's one way to support that and say, I want my contribution to go towards your, your, your program there. Uh, that's, that, that's one way. I would say uh, also to get in touch with that um, sc school, whatever school that is, uh, to reach out to them. And I know that they have opportunities there for whether that's writing to them or supporting or being a part of. There's, there's ways to support those particular schools. Hope that helps answer that question. Can either of you comment on Matthew 25? Quote, when we were, when were you in prison and I visited you and how it affects our approach to these needs? So I think we should all be rooted in Matthew 25. I'd like to, not to change the words of Jesus, but I, I think sometimes when he said, uh, when I was in prison, did you come and educate me? Okay. <laughs> That's the way I think I would, that's what I hear him saying is when you come and visit, but well, what's a greater visit than to have that conversation about education, right? Trey, you want to have a comment on 25, Matthew? And especially the part where they say, well, when you was in the joint, dude, you know, I mean, 
how you treat the least among you is how you treat God as you understand him. That's how you treat the Lord. And that's what I do in all my endeavors. I mean, like, for instance, if a person who you qualify as your friend because they're saying all the right things, doing all the right things, and they cold and need a coat, it don't take a lot of effort to give them your coat or to lend them a coat. But do it for a person who have called you a rascal, a person that you really don't like that much. Do it for them, and then you appreciate Matthews 25 in a much more primordial level. And, and, and places like prisons will probably, especially the administrative and will probably fight and resist having a Jesuit education coming because a genuine education inspires revolt. It demands that you be better and different than what you are. And prisons want to maintain a status quo. So every faculty that I saw, you know, Georgetown try to bring in, it was resisted. And it's supposed to be if you're bringing in a genuine education, because the recipient of it will revolt and will never again be satisfied with the status quo. I'm not satisfied with just being a, a low level drug dealer who, you know, I want to make the world better because I'm here. Last question, and then we're going to have Deanna wrap us up. How are people in prison selected? Does demand exceed the supply of classes? Yes, demand exceeds the supply. Uh, so in some of the schools, uh, push this out. Uh, and a whole class is just like you apply to college. Writing an essay, you need to have your completed your high school. Uh, in, one of the, in one of the facilities, uh, first time out, we had maybe 55, 60. We were a little disappointed. We thought we'd have more. This was a facility where like 1,200. And uh, interviewed those and started a cohort. Well, then as some were released, uh, we said, well, we can replenish. So about six were released. So we had 14 spaces. So we issued uh, the invitation again. This time we had close to 300. Well, what happened? We said, well, why did, was it the first time you had so few? And the, and the response was, we didn't think you were serious. So yes, the supply it certainly uh, outpaces, uh, or the demand certainly outpaces this supply. So what about that? Can we do more and more? It creates a, costs a lot of resources, but, but we're, we've got this, what can we do that's modest, achievable, and sustainable, and kind of move on that? But can we move from this being a program to being a movement, which is really all about our shared humanity and seeing one another as my sister and my brother? Um, one last story. One of the students in our program uh, accepted. Now he's just completed a degree. I won't say the institution, so to preserve that person's uh, identity. Um, but shared with me that came in clearly a strong white supremacist. And this Jesuit education is transformed and now says, I truly see him as my brother. I see her as my sister. They're the kind of things that we're experiencing. Thank you very, very much for this opportunity to be with you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Father Curran. Thank you, Orlando. My name is Deanna House Spiro. I have the honor of serving as the Vice President of Communications the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities, AJCU, and also on the Alpha Sigma Nu Board of Directors. We are so grateful for your work with the Jesuit Prison Education Network and for your time with us tonight. This program tonight was made possible due to the efforts of so many people. Thank you to Georgetown University and ASN Chapter Coordinator, Megan Hogg, for helping to carry out logistics. Thanks to Megan Ollinger and the Georgetown Student Chapter for co-sponsoring this. And a special thank you to Jack Landers, who was unable to make it in person tonight, who helped plan this event as president of the Washington, D.C. Alumni Club. Jack has been president of the D.C. Alumni Club for 20 years. In that time, he has planned many events connected with the local chapter of students, bringing ASN members together, promoting our tenets of scholarship, loyalty, and service. Jack is retiring from his role, but we know he will still be involved in future ASN events in the DC area. 
Thank you to everyone for attending. And on behalf of Alpha Sigma Nu, we wish you all the best as you go forth and set the world on fire.